I remember the first year Pastor Tyson encouraged me to go and he made a statement to me that I'll never forget. He said, Brent, you will never read the Bible the same again. And he was right. Seeing the things and being where Jesus was when he walked this earth was a life-changing experience. Being in the same place Paul wrote from a prison cell where Elijah called down fire from heaven and being in a boat on the sea that Jesus walked on, water is so humbling, so eye-opening, and so heart-opening. It's hard to explain in a way that does it justice. It has uh, changed my life, it's changed my relationship with God, and I grew closer to my Savior and the people that we went on the trip with. We had an enjoyable group of people both years and grew so much closer to each other. There were times that we laughed, times we cried, and many times we were just overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. I love the deep history and culture that who show us how to work together to achieve our goals. To the medical workers who give health and healing to the hurting. To the architects and builders who create spaces where people can come together. To the artists and musicians who create beauty and inspire us to do great things. To the officers and soldiers who protect our families, our cities, and our nation. To the pastors and church workers who care for our souls. To all who labor, we want you to know your work matters. It matters to you. It matters to us. And most importantly, it matters to God. Good morning, 11 a.m. service. Would you stand with me? It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Would you look at your neighbor and say, man, you look good. Go ahead and tell him. Go ahead and tell him, man, you look good. Even if they're struggling a little bit, man, they look good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. My name is Pastor Tyson. It's a privilege to pastor this awesome church, and um, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful that you continue to show up on a weekend that's Labor Day weekend, you could be at the lake. Wait, there's no water in the lake, so I'm sorry. You can't be at the lake, but you, you could be elsewhere, and you chose to worship with us today. You, if you're here for the first time, you were given a worship guide when you came in. This worship guide has several different things. It has your message notes. When we jump into the message, it has a tithe envelope. And then it has this uh, connection card, and we want to connect with you. So if you're a first-time guest, we want you to take out this card or maybe you're a regular attender, remember you've been here for 15 years, we want you to use this card to connect, and especially if you're a first-time guest, fill this out for us, and then on the back for everyone, there's a place where you can talk about your prayer requests, and we have a prayer team that intercedes for you, we want to stand with you in prayer, but during service, uh, we, you, you have a chance to fill this out, but at the end, if you're a first-time guest, we want you to take this connection card by the Connect desk on your way out. And the person there will give you a gift just to say thank you for coming. But if you're a regular attender, remember, fill this out. Go ahead and place this in the offering basket during the middle of service when we receive offering. We're here for one thing and one thing only, and that's to worship Jesus. Amen? And so let's, do, let, let's lay aside every distraction, everything that would hinder us from that. we got stuff going on this afternoon and tomorrow, and we've got to get back into the books and school and all that stuff. Let's just take an hour and about 10 minutes an hour and 10 minutes, and focus on Jesus. Can we do that? Let's welcome him here. Father, we welcome you in this place. Holy Spirit, come, and as we focus on you, may your spirit invade our space. May our praises be a sweet aroma to you. And as that takes place, may your presence come and minister to every person in this room. And we all said, amen. Let's worship the Lord. Darkness, who's 
stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cry, you lay down your life, that you would be set free. that you've done for me who brings who brings our chaos back in new order who makes the orphan the son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nation
the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope and who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. It's grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living Lord And then came the promise That for the promise Your buried body begins to silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me when I sing that again then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe its grip on me and you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Amen God is good Worthy of every song, 
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, we sing holy. There is no one like you, there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Let's sing that verse again, worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Sing Jesus the name above. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
talks about the house on the sand versus the house on the rock and the difference when the storms come because we all know the storms come but the house built on the rock stands I just have a sense that I know the reality is we all struggle with keeping our house built on the rock there's a lot of things in our lives we seem to build on the rock and a lot of things we don't but I feel like every minute is an opportunity to rededicate your life to being built on the rock his grace is sufficient for us So I'm gonna sing that bridge again. Just give us a moment to think about where we're built right now. there 
none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those Good to be worshiping with you this morning. I'm going to invite our ushers forward. We're going to do tithes and offerings together where we give to the Lord. I just want to remind you that that is an act of worship. Not any different than singing the songs or living the life or preaching the word. We give out of our own need because we know that he's given to us first. So ushers, I'm going to have you come forward and we're going to pray over that offering. You all can have a seat. And as you get out your tithes and offerings, we're just going to pray over and ask the Lord to bless it. So Father, we just ask a blessing right now over these seeds that go into your kingdom. May the soil be good. May you bring multiplication, Lord. We speak a blessing of multiplication over this offering, over these tithes, in Jesus' name. Bless those hands that give it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, go ahead and pass that out. Worthy of every song we could ever of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. God, it is good to have somebody to rely on, to have a foundation, and that foundation is in you and you alone. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you minister to us today? In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Would you look at your neighbor and say, Man, worship, worship just does something for me. Tell them. Tell them how, what, what does worship do for you? Go ahead and tell them. It just uplifts my soul, doesn't it? Would you, would you tell our worship team thank you for, for leading us in worship today? Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Gina. All right. Good deal. Would you go ahead and take out your notes, and uh, we're going to be jumping into our last sermon on the series Sweet Like Honey, and uh, we're going to dive into that here just real quickly, but before we get there, I want to make mention of two things. One is that if you are interested in going to Israel with me, I would love for you to attend. It is at the end of January, January 23rd through February 2nd. If 
you want more information, I can give that to you. You can find it on the website. You can find it in different places uh, on the app. We want you to go with us. It will change your life. I remember taking George and Diane, and just something powerful happens when you go to Israel. Uh, if you want more information, please come talk to me. We'll get that for you. The deadline is October 29th. October 29th, we want you to get registered and get to Israel with me. Secondly, I just want to give you a report on some things that are happening um, in, our, in our network. So I, I want you to know North Platte, the North Platte Church is growing. It's awesome. And uh, Pastor Vaughn is doing a great job there. Uh, just recently, at the beginning of the summer, the city sewer backed up, and they were at the low point, and so the city sewer backed up all into their basement. And I happened to be there. It was bad. And so they just today opened up the basement to Kids Rock in that area. It's like a $150,000 project, and they opened today their Kids Rock back from the summer. So praise the Lord for that. Would you give the Lord a clap offering? Pastor Vaughn was just frantic when all this stuff was going on. This wasn't only the first time. This was actually the second time. Uh, our location in Cody, Wyoming, uh, Cody Foursquare Church, is doing really well. Pastor Shane has done a great job. Uh, this one has been more of a difficult time in the revitalization of that church, but Pastor Shane and his wife Lindsay are doing a great job sticking with it, and we're looking forward to what God's got for them this season. And then in Lander, Wyoming, Pastor Jeff who is our Celebrate Recovery pastor here, he's just rocking it, man. Things are happening there. This week they did a, they did a documentary on, on the church and what God is doing. and So really cool stuff. In fact, next, on, on September 25th, uh, Pastor Ken is taking the church bus to Lander for those who would like to go on a journey. They're going to leave on a Saturday and then come back Sunday afternoon. But during that time, you're going to have a couple barbecues and uh, hang out. If you want more information about going to Lander on the church bus, uh, there is information on the Connect desk. Make sure that you uh, fill that out. There's a sign-up sheet, all the details, all the costs. And you can also see Pastor Ken, and I'll pray when you ride with Pastor Ken, all right? <laughs> what? <laughs> all right, good. All right, so it's good to be in the house today. We're concluding our series, Sweet Like Honey, and um, we're, we've been talking about God's promises to us that his words are sweeter than honey. In fact, we base this off of Psalm 109, or Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This verse reminds us just how sweet God's promises are to us. We talked about rest, we talked about grace, and today we're going to talk about a promise that is probably the best promise that all of us in this room could ever attain, that we could ever receive, that we could ever, we could ever imagine. And this is the promise of forgiveness. His promise, uh, he promises us forgiveness through his son, Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? So one of the reasons why I like this is because honey is really the antidote for the allergies in our life. And what do they say? They say, grab the local honey when you get there because it has some things in the plants that will really help you deal with the allergic reaction to certain uh, allergies. So anyway, I believe that God's word is just that and more for us, that it is something that will help us live this life to the fullest. And one of the things that we can do is that when he promises us, for, promises us forgiveness, we can live life to the fullest. Amen, anybody? All right. So there was a time in my life where forgiveness became really real to me. Uh, I was about eight, seven or eight years old, and my youngest brother was born, and my youngest brother was getting all the attention. He was about one year old, and this Aaron could walk at the eight months. He, eight months, he was just running and walking, and one time he came into our, my room, uh, and, and I didn't like it. So he had a bottle of apple juice. So me and my friend thought it would behoove us to make more apple juice, or at least what it looked like, and so we did do that. And the next thing you know, he took a drink of that bottle, and he started to vomit everywhere. So we had to cover it up. We had to make up a story that was fabricated. My little eight-year-old self telling my mom the reason he threw up was there's a feather on, underneath the bed that he ate. Shame on you. 
My brother's still working on forgiving me. But let me tell you what happened that weekend. We ended up going to church on a Sunday night where we were uh, there at the Baptist Church in Sterling, Colorado, and we were watching the Jesus film. And little eight-year-old Tyson was sitting on the back row watching Jesus film, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me like never before. I started to cry, and my dad thought maybe the movie was making me cry. No, I was scared out of my wits, because I knew that I needed to come clean. Anybody ever been there in your life where you know, "Ah, I got to eat crow here, I got to do something, and so I told my dad, what did I said, Dad, we need to go talk, and so during the movie, I'm shaking, crying, and we go back to a Sunday school room, and I tell my dad what had actually happened. My dad was very gracious to me, very kind, but I didn't get away with the, without a consequence. So right there in the Sunday school room, I faced a consequence, but the consequence that I faced was merely nothing compared to the conviction that the Lord had placed on my life. I was convicted. I was convicted. Maybe you are here today and you have felt that conviction. I want you to know that God is here to forgive you. And that's the good news, is that the promise of his forgiveness is is important. So today we're talking about this. It's a quality of God's character. Forgiveness is a quality of God's character. In fact, we're invited to receive this character promise, forgiveness. All of us in this room, we're invited. But when we talk about forgiveness, we must also talk about what is required to receive it. Because there's something required to receive the forgiveness. Along the way, we have come to the conclusion that all of us in here today are sinners. Go ahead and look at your neighbor. And you've been wanting to say this for a long time. I'm giving you permission. Just look at him and say, you're a sinner. Go ahead. With some gusto, not, not sarcasm. With some realness. Right? The Bible says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that all of us, at some point, have fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe some of you on the way to church today, you've fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. In other words, to say this is that none of us are perfect. Not anyone in this room, we're not perfect. This is the reason we need a Savior, is because Jesus Christ is the one who is perfect, and because He's perfect, He's given us access to His righteousness. Now, He's made a way for us to receive this forgiveness so that we may experience this new abundant life. But there's some requirements that we have to do, some things that we must do in order to receive this promise. So what does this concept of promise actually look like? It's important to understand this to all God's people, that we understand this. So there are many amazing things about forgiveness. About We, we could spend two years unpacking this idea of forgiveness and still not really touch the surface. There's so much packed into this that, that, that forgiveness and its effect on people, forgiveness and its effect on our soul, and not only on our soul, but on our mind and on our well-being. This idea of forgiveness is is broad, it's vast, it's freeing, and it's hopeful. We couldn't possibly cover all of them. So turn with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John, this is also in your app. If you don't have the app downloaded, you could download the Rock Church app, scan the QR code on the back of the worship guide. It says this, if we confess our sins, say that, say that with me, just those Five words, one, two, three. If we confess our sins. One more time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, if we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I should be hearing some amens right now because this, my friends, is what's wrapped up in Christianity. This is what Jesus did for us, that if we confess, he is. Who is he? He's faithful and he's just to do what? To forgive you of your unrighteousness. That's good news. That's God news. Spurgeon says it this way. The text, 1 John 1, 9, means just this. Treat God truthfully, and he will treat you truthfully. Treat God truthfully, and he will treat you truthfully. Make no pretensions before God, but lay bare your soul. Let him see it as it is, and then he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first step in the process is that you must confess your sin. You have to confess. It's actually the one thing that we must initiate. We have to take the step. The Bible says that we need to confess our sins to our Heavenly Father who is listening. Confession translates in a, to a verb in the present tense. That means that we should keep on confessing our sin. Not just a once and for all, but we keep on confessing our sin. And the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our past, our present, and our future sin. You must continue to confess. There is part of this where you are responsible for it, just like I was on the back pew. I mean, it was red carpet, dingy, dingy pews. It smelled, and I'm shaking. I knew that I needed to confess this sin. Listen, I'm grateful that I don't have to go to a confessional booth to receive forgiveness for my sin. Okay. I don't have, I, I'm grateful that you don't have to tell me all your sins. Like, we don't have to go back to that room and you have to sit there and tell me all my sins. Praise the Lord. Because I probably want to punch you. No, just kidding. We have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become in the right standing. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, is what Romans says, who is interceding for us so we can confess our sins right here, right now. And Jesus himself is interceding for us to the Father for the remission of our sins. Come on, somebody. That's good news. That's good news. But we have to admit that we're sinners, that we've done sin by asking for his divine intervention, his divine forgiveness. Now, this means when we cry out to God, when we cry out asking him for something like forgiveness, Jesus becomes the mediator because we have no right to have direct communication with the Holy Father. Now, think about this. You and I, have no business communicating with an almighty, righteous God, a holy, pure God. In fact, Isaiah says that when he saw him, he had to cover his face and cover his feet because the brightness of his glory shone through. John, in Revelation, talks about seeing the Holy One of God, the, the Father. We have no right, but Jesus made a way. Aren't you grateful for that? That he is now the propitiation of our sins, standing in as a mediator between us and God, praying for us. That's good news. Interceding for us. Do you remember the concept a few weeks ago, last week, that we talked about grace? I brought up Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, and it says, Let us then draw with confidence near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need, help in a time of need. We must remember that God's ultimate desire is to show grace and mercy to all of us. To sinners just like you and me. That God's ultimate desire, part of his character, part of his character structure, is to show grace and mercy. And he does throw through, through forgiveness. Through forgiveness, we recognize our need for a Savior. Confession comes into play. And after we confess our sins to the Lord, it's time for us to receive his grace. So when you confess... 
you now begin to receive his grace, the unmerited favor. But I want you to know something, that grace is not only receiving something you don't deserve, but it's also the empowerment for you to live this life today free from sin. Okay, some of you are not getting this. Grace is more than God's goodwill towards us. It's more than that. It's his willing us to do in us and for us that which we could never do on our own. It's an action, not an attribute. In fact, have you ever thought about the grace of God's love in action? That he not only forgives you of your sin, but now he does something deep inside of you to keep you free from that sin. That's his grace. He empowers you to live a life worthy. Okay, maybe, maybe you're not getting this just yet. Let's dive down into this. Grace is much, much more than we could ever imagine. But grace propels us to repentance. To say, I don't want to do that again. You're walking this way? Grace says, no, I want to empower you to make a 180 degree turn and go the other way. There's something deep down inside that propels you not to do the same thing over again, which is called insanity. And some of us live in insanity with our sin. Oh God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He forgives you, and then you go right back to it. And you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. But his grace is actually the empowerment for you to live above and beyond that sin. Amen? Don't worry, the crackers are covered, I'm spitting, we're good. (laughs) If you're not getting this just yet. The Hebrew mind would think of grace as something God does, his benevolent activities on our behalf. The Greek influencers talked about abstract. The Hebrew said, this empowers us. The Hebrew mindset says, this empowers us within for right living. That his grace keeps saving, keeps moving, keeps diving down in, and it empowers us from within to live this life. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm starting to get there. Grace not only is something we don't deserve, but it actually, actually empowers us to have a heart transformation. So we stop saying, I, sorry God, and we stop doing the same things over and over again. All right. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness, and live in ways that please the Lord. Okay, so how do we receive this? you got to receive grace, forgiveness. Here's what I would argue today. Accepting the fact that God forgives us and accepting God's forgiveness for ourselves are two very different things, and often one is easier than the other. Let me unpack this for you. There are many times when I don't treat Tammy well at all, my wife. She was here the first service, and she will tell you the exact same thing I'm telling you. I yell at her, and I, treat, I don't treat her gently, and I don't love her as Christ loved the church. In fact, at times, I treat her very, very wrong. 1 Peter says, Husbands, love your wives, live with your wives in an understanding, show honor to the woman who's a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you and have the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, listen here. The Bible's very clear that if we don't treat our wives as God would want us to, our prayers are hindered. And anything that hinders a prayer must be wrong. Okay, let that sink for just a moment. Anything that hinders prayer must be absolutely wrong. Something is off kilter. The failure to live as a godly husband really has spiritual consequences. And the spiritual consequences are that my prayers are hindered. Are you with me? If anything is injuring or damaging our power of prayer, there is urgent demand for correction. Urgent demand. One time I was yelling at Tammy so bad that yes, your pastor even cussed her out. 
I was mad. I was speaking harshly. I was critical. I was acting violently out of that anger. I sinned. I was not righteous at all. After I settled down, I thought, man, what a jerk I am. I need to seek Jesus to forgive me. It took me a while to get on my knees before the Lord and ask God to forgive me. And so I did. And I thought, you know, I should feel different. I I spent time with the Lord, I should feel different. But the guilt and shame kept after me. And it was hard for me to receive his forgiveness, his grace. Maybe you've been here before, you cry out, confessing to God. You ask him to forgive you. You know the Bible makes it clear, and it's all here, but you don't feel it here. Anybody know what I'm talking about in the room today? But you still find yourself feeling this weight of shame and condemnation. I'm here to let you know today that's not God's voice. Condemnation does not come from the Lord. Therefore, now, there now for is no condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus. But he says, if we confess with our mouth, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He wants us to receive his forgiveness. Now, key is knucklehead Dyson doesn't keep using my mouth as a battering ram. And the only way that I can do that is with the help and power of the Holy Spirit and his grace propelling me to do what? Love her as Christ loves the church. And what did he do for the church? He died for her, even at his own cost. Reminds me of the story of John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. You guys remember this story? The religious leaders brought her out before the crowd, which included Jesus, to stone her to death. But before they did, they wanted Jesus' opinion on the matter. Isn't that interesting? We're going to tell you what we all want. Oh, by the way, Jesus, what do you think? And I think that's what we often do, don't we? We want everybody else's opinion, and then we say, oh, by the way, Jesus, what do you think? And then he turns it all upside down, which he did. Jesus tells the religious leaders, you who've never sinned, you cast the first stone. And sure enough, one by one, they dropped their stones and they walked away. And this is what Jesus said, John chapter 8. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go from now on, and do what? Sin no more. See, you've got to get this concept of grace. We confess, we receive, but this empowerment of grace allows us to turn away from sin and begin to walk towards Jesus. Come on, somebody. But you've got to confess, you've got to receive, and then you've got to go and sin no more. We're cleansed. This is based on 1 John, verse seems to be the outcome of receiving. The Bible talks a lot about the cleansing power of the Lord. And Isaiah says that, come, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And I think a lot of us, we have a lot of mud on our face. And we're pretty disgraced. And Jesus, with his blood, takes his life and begins to wipe it off. He begins to make it clear. And you know what? Who's got the scars? Who's got the mud? When he takes it from you, who takes it? Jesus takes it. And we get a little healing, we get a little reprieve, and then Jesus comes and he takes a little bit more from us. And then he begins to cleanse us from the inside out. He begins to work on us. And in no time, by his grace and the empowerment, living and trying to do what he says, all of a sudden, you can begin to see again. I think there's so many people in this room, you have so many scars, so many wounds, 
and you haven't confessed them, or maybe you have confessed them, but you continue to do the same thing over and over again. And God is saying, listen, child, listen, son, listen, daughter, if you confess your sin, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. But not only that, I want to empower you to live righteously. I want to empower you to live in freedom. I want to empower you to live holy. And here's the cool thing. When you begin to understand that and begin to live that, your heart is transformed. You begin to not only live in obedience, but you're willing to sacrifice your life. And you walk in obedience. And it's a transformed heart. This is where God's sacrificial offering of Jesus comes into play. Because the blood that was shed on the cross, our sins are forgiven. That's good news. Confess, receive, and be cleansed. To mean holy, be set apart. Set apart. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Let me ask this question. For everybody in this room, I want you to answer this. Is there a sweeter promise of God than that of forgiveness? That's the sweetest promise. That's the sweetest promise. To know that we are eternally forgiven in Christ is the greatest promise that we could ever receive. That we're forgiven restored, redeemed in our relationship with our Creator, who tells us through the prophet Isaiah, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my sake, my own sake. I will not remember your sins. I will not remember your sins. God says, the Father says, I will not remember your sins. Come on, somebody, that's good news. He also says that He removes them as far as the east is from the west. That He continually cleanses us continually works on us, forgive us of our sins, our past, our present, our future, if we're willing to confess them and say, you know what, I was a knucklehead and I need God to help me. He is that faithful. And for that, he should be worshipped. I want to do something as the worship team comes. Would you stand? I know there are people in this room people watching online, that you've never given your heart to Jesus. And if you were a believer in this room, I would ask that you begin to pray because there is a battle going on. You do not know Jesus, and knowing Jesus is the most important thing that you could receive. Knowing Him, that you would say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I confess that I am in need of you. If you're here today, or you're watching online, and you need Jesus as your Savior, I don't want you to hesitate. You need to receive forgiveness of your sin. Maybe you've known Jesus for a while, and you walked away. And there's a conviction, there's something that's deep within, that you need Jesus to do. You want to receive Him as your Savior. If you're in this room and you would say, Pastor, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. I need to confess my sin. I need Him as my Lord and Savior. Anybody in this room, I don't want to miss this opportunity. All the way in the back. Yes, brother. That's a brave decision. I see you all the way in the back. I knew God had an encounter for you, my friend, when you came in today. I didn't know what it was, but I knew He was going to encounter you. This is the most important decision that you could ever make in your life. It's brave. To raise your hand, that is a brave decision. It starts with a prayer, but it's a lifestyle. It's now you're turning and you're going to walk towards His grace. This is what it starts with. Jesus, I believe in You. I confess my sin and I repent. I believe that You died and that You rose again so that I could be saved. Today I surrender to You and I give You my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, give the Lord a clap offering. Amen.
I have a Bible for you today, my friend. I want to see you right after service. Now, for the rest of us who know Jesus, there's a time of confession, a time of repentance. I don't know what your sin is. It could be gossip. It could be slander. It could be malice. It could be hate. It could be pornography. It could be alcoholism. It could be addictions. It could be drugs. It could be homosexuality. It could be a plethora of sin. But today, the Lord wants you to start free and clear. All of us are sinners. Come on. We established that. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to pray. I want you to ask God to forgive you. Would you? Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. The Bible tells us before we receive communion, remembering what Jesus has done for us and looking forward to his return that we are to receive communion as a body of believers. And one of the things we should do is scrub our heart. And then also if you have issue with a brother or sister in Christ, you are to take care of that before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Here at the Rock Church, if you are a believer in Christ, you are welcome to receive communion with us. We want you to receive communion with us. So what's going to happen is that when you're ready, the ushers are going to dismiss from the back to the front. You're going to come down. Go ahead, usher team, or communion team. You're going to grab your elements. You're going to walk back down the outside of the aisle on your side. Hold on to those elements and we'll receive them together as a body of believers. But I want to make sure you get your heart right with Jesus. Get your heart right with the brother or sister in Christ. Don't partake if the, neither one of those are fixed. And allow the Lord to begin to do a work. And as we do, would you worship with us? Would you, would you sing how great our God is? Because He is a good God. Just think, He's forgiven us of our sin. We're free. Come on, somebody. We're free because of his body and his blood. Go ahead, ushers. Would you please pass or dismiss row by row?
we pour out our praise and one of the ways we do that is through communion you called us to remember your body that was beaten and bruised not broken and the blood that poured from your brow to remember the remission of our sin that you by your grace by your power became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God you took it on your shoulders wasn't easy it was painful but yet you had each one of us on your mind thank you Jesus for your body and blood that was shed so that we could live thank you for the cracker that represents your body the cup of juice that represents your blood and we do this in remembrance of what you did but not only what you did what you're going to do John 14 you say you went to prepare a place for us and if you went to prepare a place you're going to come get us. You're going to come and receive us. And we look forward to that day, the wedding supper of the Lamb. In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Let's partake. Would you lift your hands in front of you? We're going to sing this bridge one more time. And I, I want you to know who Jesus is. And sometimes it requires action. So as we sing this, lift your hands, lift your eyes to the Lord, and worship Him. Our hearts will come. 
cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, all the earth. Yes, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. time all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we spending Sunday with you today. I want to invite our prayer team forward this morning. If you would like to receive prayer ministry, I want to encourage you as we dismiss to come on up and pray with our prayer team. They'll be up front here. And let me send you out with this blessing. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. God bless you all. It's your breath. Hello, online community. We're so thankful that you've joined the Rock Church online experience. We value you, and we are praying for you. You can learn more about us at therockne.com or follow us on Facebook at The Rock NE. We'd love to meet you in person. Be sure to say hello when you see our staff around town. If you'd like to attend a service, we invite you to be our guest Sundays at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Let me send you off with a blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.